Well, howdy, YouTube family. It's Bolt CRNA coming to you again with another week's topic. This week, we're going to be talking about what my daily life is like as a nurse anesthesiologist or CRNA. And a lot of you guys kind of are curious. What, what's it like when you, you just go into work and you get report on patients? It's, it's very different from what your life is like as an RN. So I'm kind of gonna, I'm gonna give you like a rundown uh, from point A to point B to point C or whatever of what my typical day flows like. So as many of you may know, surgery usually starts pretty early in the morning. Most facilities start around seven in the morning. So it depends on the facility actually. Some places you may start at eight in the morning, some may start at 7.15, some 7.30, some seven. You might even have a, a rare situation where they ask you to start a room at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, so those are earlier cases. So you have to think about, so if you're, if you say seven o'clock, say standard 7 a.m. start time for surgery is this time. Well, you need to be at the hospital in enough time that you can change out into OR scrubs. You can go set up your OR room with your drugs, your airway equipment, IV supplies. If the patient doesn't have an IV, emergency backup equipment, you need to also check your you know, anesthesia machine and some of your devices to make sure they're functioning, make sure you have suction set up. Uh, these are all important things to check every morning before you get there or before you get started with surgery. So you need to get to the hospital early enough to be able to do all those things and then you need to go see the patient in the pre-op area. They're going to be in a pre-op bay waiting on you. So <clears throat> different people arrive at different times based off how long it's going to take them to do these things. If you have an open heart surgery case to do that morning, those are big cases and those are going to require you to be setting up for 45 minutes, maybe an hour. There's a lot of setting up. There's lots of drugs to get together. There's lots of things you have to do for those types of cases. If you're coming in and you're doing like a finger excision or something and it's going to be a local MAC type monitored anesthesia care, MAC means monitored anesthesia care case. Uh, where they're literally gonna have a nasal cannula and uh, some local anesthetic and just a little propofol, it might take you five minutes to set up your room for that case. That can be very quick and easy. So you don't need to get there an hour early to set up for that five minute case. Uh, so you maybe sleep in a little bit more that morning. Um, the other thing to think about is your patient. So a lot of times you'll look up your patients the day before, sometimes even the week before. You'll have, usually most places will let you know what cases the following week on which days they want you to, to provide anesthesia for. So you can look up the patient, you can look up all the information about them, you can look up their labs, you can look up their medical history, you can look up the last time they were in the hospital, what it was for, if they have cardiac stents, if they have respiratory problems, what medications they're typically taking. Uh, you, you can analyze all, this, all these details and that will help you formulate kind of what your anesthetic plan for that case is going to be because plans will change based off of the uh, patient status and what's going on with them. And sometimes you actually need to optimize them more. They may need some serious optimization to make them safe for the anesthetic. So sometimes you may have to um, send them for a cardiac clearance or something like that if there's something really going on with them that's you know, pretty, pretty intense. So you're gonna look up those people at least a day before, but probably even maybe a week before prior. And, and at my facility, we actually send them letters. We send them like a little letter with our information and our name and explaining what we're gonna be doing for them and also reminding them not to eat the morning of surgery and drink and all that stuff the morning of. So um, we do all that to touch base with them so they have an idea of who we're gonna be providing their anesthesia and, and touch, you know, just kind of a, a nice little touch base with them so that the morning of surgery, they're not seeing my name or hearing me or seeing my face for the very first time. So anyway, you do all that, that should give you your information so that the night before surgery the next day, you kind of know, do I need to get, be getting there early? Is this an open heart case? Is this a complicated patient? Are they gonna need a long pre-op period with me? A am I expecting to have to go through a lot of questions about in-depth things, about their COPD management and their sleep apnea and a bleeding disorder and a spina bifida and just all these other types of medical disease processes going on with them? If I know they have a lot going on, I know I'm gonna need longer with them in pre-op. I'm going to have to talk to them a good bit more and figure out exactly what's going on with all these processes and make sure I understand what a good baseline for them is before we go have surgery. So 
that all plays into the factor of like exactly how early do you need to be getting there. On average, I would say I get there um, if I know the surgery needs to be starting at 7.30, I will be there probably at like 6.45. And if it's for a normal patient and a normal surgery, I'll probably get to the hospital like 6.45. And that will give me enough time to get dressed, get my stuff ready in the room, go pre-op my patient, you know, make sure everything's set up last minute, make sure that, that when I talk to the surgeon that, that we're all on the same page, what the surgeon is needing for the surgery, I'm aware of, and I have my anesthetic plan is gonna meet all those needs. So, my day starts like that. I, um, usually it's, you know, seven o'clock, 7.30 start time, sometimes eight o'clock if you're in a surgery center, and it's a little bit later start times occasionally. And so then you, you take your patient back when the surgeon checks the patient off and they say, that, you know, they mark the arm or they mark whatever they're working on and they say, now it's time to roll back. You roll back with the circulator, you induce anesthesia, you establish an airway, whatever you need to do for the case. Uh, you then monitor and maintain the anesthetic throughout the entire case until surgery's over and you're also responsible for all vital signs stuff that's happening, maintaining blood pressure and heart rate and making sure good urine output is happening and make sure that their brain is getting perfusion and make sure they're not you know, throwing clots to their lungs and having a PE and making sure they're ventilating well and oxygenating well and all of the, you're pretty much maintaining their body throughout surgery. Everything that's not being cut on, that the surgeon is actually cutting on and removing or placing or whatever they're doing, everything outside of that zone is your responsibility to maintain for the surgery. So you're gonna do that for however long the surgery is and then when the surgery is over, you're going to slowly start to wake them up from anesthesia. Now waking up from anesthesia, I like to equate to landing a plane. So it's a long process. It's not a flipping of a switch and you just wake up uh, to get someone deep, deep down to where they can anesthetically uh, be deep enough that they can be cut open and have major things done to their body and they don't respond to that or move or have pain responses. That's a very deep level of anesthetic you're having to do for them. So to get them all the way back from that to where they're breathing on their own again and they're maintaining all their own stuff without your help anymore, it's, a, it's quite tricky and uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in that process so it takes a little bit of time and you and you kind of have to walk them back from it uh, as you're as you're you know getting more skilled in, in your training you get better at that and this is the phase that we call emergence and that's they're emerging from their anesthetic essentially uh, so you'll do that for your patient you'll go through emergence then probably you should have hopefully remove the airway if they're breathing fine on their own and supposed to be going home that day you don't want to leave an airway in their mouth uh, so then you would remove that, take them to the recovery room. You'll give them handoff report to a recovery room nurse, which is a PACU nurse. And then you'll sign off on the patient. You'll sign that they're healthy and, and you know, vital signs are stable and they're comfortable and they're breathing well and everything looks like it's being handled well. There's no serious adverse events from the anesthetic. And then you will um, leave and go see your next patient. So the next surgery, you pretty much start the process off again. You make sure that you go get your drugs set up. You make sure your equipment's good to go. You make sure that, you know, pre-op the next patient. And you essentially kind of do that over and over until whatever, whether the last case is finished, if you promise to stay till the cases are done, some facilities will ask you to work on that kind of schedule where you will, um, you'll be assigned to an OR room and you are allowed to leave when that OR room is done, essentially, like you, your job is to finish out that OR room. So once the OR room's finished, you're done for the day, you get to go home. Uh, some other places ask you to do like a set amount of time. So they may say, hey, can you work 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. for us? and they expect you to kind of stay. So if you finish up your room and all your OR cases at 2 p.m., they may not ask you to go home, they may ask you to go over to room six next door to you and let someone else out who was supposed to go home early but their cases are running long. So you may take over their cases and finish up their cases. Maybe if you cover o OB, LND, they may ask you like, hey, you finished up early, can you go help them on the OB floor and do epidurals or maybe a C-section or some kind of um, issue or something going on with the OB department, you may go help with that. Maybe you don't do anything for a while. Maybe you go do some research or you go sit at your desk and you uh, work on some CEUs or work on some kind of quality control project for the department or something. There's, there's lots of stuff that you can do. Uh, but essentially that's how kind of your workflow goes. You go home and then you may have another day of that. And I have a whole different video talking about CRNA schedules as far as like 
hours and the days that we work and stuff like that. But in the, the general logistics of what our workflow is like, that's pretty much it. That's kind of how anesthesia goes, is that kind of workflow. And then when you're finished, you, you know, change out of your OR scrubs and you get to go home. And then you'll do it again the next day. And like I mentioned, if you have surgeries the next day that you haven't already looked up, at some point during that day, you'll be looking up the next day's cases and, and beginning, beginning like uh, research on their disease processes and everything going on. So there's a lot of that that we do in uh, anesthesia of like looking up patients, understanding their backgrounds, formulating anesthetic plans that are tailored to that unique type of patient situation. Now, I don't want you to think that that is just the only thing that we ever do always, and that's you know the, the, the same thing every single anesthesia provider ever does. There's other places that you can kind of function if you like pain management. I know some CRNAs who do pain management, and they see patients, and they do epidural injections, and they do other types of like visiting with patients and talking about their chronic pain issues, so you can do that. If you want to work in a GI clinic, there's GI uh, anesthesia where you do a lot of GI cases back to back to back, and that's a slightly different workflow and a little bit faster. Same with eye center cases where you don't induce general anesthesia on most patients. You just give a little bit of sedation, and those patients roll through a lot faster. You can work as a professor as a CRNA. Some people work as a professor and teach. Uh, you can you know, do some admin work as a CRNA and then you're, you're not really doing clinical anesthesia all the time. Uh, if you like doing blocks, there are certain people who just do blocks all day. So in that sense, your workflow is going to be different. Uh, you're, you're not really going to be doing anesthesia as far, you'll, you'll be doing blocks for patients all day. You won't be going to the OR as much as you will be like finding patients that need blocks and placing them. Maybe that's in the ER. Uh, maybe that is, uh, you know, in the, in the OR or in PACU, a rescue block with a patient who's having a lot of pain and breakthrough pain or something like that. Or it could be on the floor, a patient who's post on day one and needs you know more pain control or something so yeah there's a lot of stuff and that's not even mentioning being on call so when you're on call the workflow is going to be very different much more sporadic uh, so there can be quite a bit of variation to that but I would say the description of what I gave you is 80% of what most of us do day in and day out uh, for the most of the part uh, there's there's always variation but I would say it's a good rule of thumb if you like the way that that sounds of that workflow then that's probably good because anesthesia might be a good fit for you. Well, all right guys, if you have not hit that like button, what the heck are you doing? Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. A lot of you guys watch my videos, but tons of you don't subscribe. 75% of you who watch my videos don't subscribe. I don't get it, it doesn't cost you anything. Hit the subscribe button. I come back once a week, every week. Uh, I, you know, I take that one month off, but I never do that. Uh, that's a one-time thing. So from now on, weekly videos, come back, hang out with us. Until next time, let's bolt out.